one of the questions that came up is, you know, what are the pros and cons of working with a 3P partner like Pattern versus becoming the 3P seller ourselves? And I'll just say I see people obviously be successful at both. I think generally you just have to take a hard look in the mirror and look at your core competencies and what you are really good at and what you want to be good at. Um, we see a number of brands that are actually decent at Amazon, um, but you know, then, then comes in eBay, then comes in Walmart.com, then comes in the international sites. And to be able to have a true core competency for e-commerce across all of these marketplaces and maintain the control that we've been talking about and ultimately get to the growth, um, I found very few that, that are really good at it. But I think it's just part of that long-term strategic planning. I think the other thing is, especially on Amazon, you know, is, is Amazon going to allow you to be your own 3P seller? Many of the bigger brands, they'll enforce the standards for brand selling on Amazon policy and, and disallow you from actually running your own 3P store on Amazon. And so that's always a risk. We've seen a lot of brands invest massive resources to try to get that off the ground only to have it kind of gang down from under them. So that, I think that's the, the, the kind of second consideration. The third, I would say, is just, you know, the cost for, for sure. You know, everything that we do for a brand, for the product photography, to the SEO, to the advertising management, to the customer service and review management, uh, to forecasting, to everything else that we do, and certainly Zach will get to you in a second because I think you're going to have an opinion on whether or not brands can do this, um, you know, the moving boxes and logistics and fulfillment themselves. You know, it costs us, you know, around 11% of revenue to do all of those different services. And so if a brand is going to do that, 11% might be not a lot, and it might be a lot of money, depending on how big that brand is. Um, and generally what I look at it is not, you know, the actual cost right now. Can I do it for 10% today? Can I do it for 9%? But what is the opportunity cost? Because if Pattern is able to grow, our, our brands on average, you know, are growing, you know, up to 50%, you know, in their first year with us, it's how fast can you grow the brand. And if you've got, you know, data scientists and you have technologists and you have people who have been brand managers and category managers uh, at Walmart and at Amazon that are, are really being tasked with your business and growing it, generally we found that we can grow a brand a lot faster than they can grow themselves. Even if they're already growing 20, 30, 40% a year, we generally are able to arbitrage given our experience and our, our maniacal focus to grow that faster. So there's a, a myriad of factors, and I'm not here to say, you know, we can do it better than, than anyone else in house. I think those are just a number of factors that I would personally consider. And the second thing, that, uh, the final thing that I would say that, that many brands don't consider, but it's more and more apparent is, you know, when you work with something like a pattern and we're buying your inventory from you, we become a revenue center for your company. And it's just, we're, we're you know, we're an influx of cash for, for, for the company. Um, when brands try to do this on their own, they get perceived as a cost center. And so I think even the people with good intentions that are trying to run this business internally, they're constantly, you know, management might be looking or the board or investors or whomever might be coming in and start saying, how can we do this cheaper? How can we take away resources? And what we end up finding is that, that they're just not staffed. Whereas if it's a revenue center, then the best business is generally aligned to say, how can we get more revenue? out of pattern era. If we're growing those brands, you know, we like to say sometimes the brand come, brands come to us generally for control, but they stay with us because of the growth. And so I think those are just a number of factors to kind of consider. Zach, I'm, I'm interested to hear from your perspective though, you know, you certainly run into a lot of brands that may try what you're doing themselves. And we certainly work very closely with your organization on everything that we do from a fulfillment, logistics, shipping, returns, all that sort of stuff. Can you speak to that a little bit on whether or not, you know, outsourcing versus insourcing kind of argument? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good question because I think a lot of times, especially when you're in the brand seat, you're trying to cut, cut costs, right? You're trying to find, oh, I think we can do this more efficiently. I know when I was running e-commerce for a brand, I think our biggest challenge kind of came down to manufacturing and distribution just because um, I, I can get the sales team bought in, I can get, you know, the marketing team bought in, just depending on where you sit. But sometimes it's really difficult to get that distribution piece kind of nailed down. And so um, a lot of brands that come over and, and use Borderless, what they're finding is, one, they're not getting all the chargebacks, right? Because Amazon, if, they, if their warehouse processes something incorrectly, then they're going to get charged for that. And Amazon's going to make them pay to redo the work at their facility. Um, but then on top of that, I mean, th those are some basic things. Moving at another level, talking more about control, 
Um, what we offer is the opportunity to um, bundle, to kit, to bring two different items in your catalog together to make um, a product that doesn't exist in a normal channel. And it allows you to grow more. It allows you to offer new um, listings and products to your consumers that are not necessarily available in, in retail. And, you know, a lot of brands actually use it as a testing center. Do these two things make sense? together. And if it does, then I'm going to introduce it to brick and mortar. And so there's just a lot of opportunities to, to create that control. And I, you know, I want to be super clear when I say control, what I mean is a lot of these sellers who are third party on platform, their goal is just to find inventory for cheap, put as little cost into it as possible. Literally just let me put an Amazon label on it and then let me send it in and I'm going to make a quick buck. Right. And so you've got a lot of pass through sellers, that I'm sure Whitney and Adam are both very aware of that that gets super annoying. And so when you do something like, oh, I'm going to add a new step to this product for e-commerce, like make it a multi-pack or bundle it or add a prep process procedure, like put it in a poly bag, et cetera. Then all of a sudden I'm differentiating that product and it makes it harder for some random person just to find it and list it on Amazon because now they have to go and invest in your retail inventory to pull it together and make a multi-pack or to, to put it in a poly bag. And so it's just, it's not as appealing, right? It's less margin for them. They're going to move on. And so it gives you a little bit more protection. So when you think about doing that internally from a distribution perspective, you just have to ask, is my manufacturing facility able to adapt to how Amazon and other marketplaces want the inventory to be received with different labels than normally is seen in brick and mortar? And two, can they do these things that can help me control the platform more?